we seek to learn more about our Lord and grow in um, relationship with Him. If we'd uh, just turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 12. Just a, a few verses I want to take from there as well. Romans chapter 8, verse 12 to 17. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Six years ago, our lives changed for forever. Um, gone are the mornings where we could lie in and roll out of bed as we please. Gone were the times where we could go out and do whatever we wanted. Go out for a coffee maybe. We wouldn't change it for anything. Now we have children. I remember the midwife asking me if I'd like to be the one to pick Josh up for the first time, the first one to touch him, and Debs was in a birthing pool, I won't give too many details, <laughs> but she was, the birthing pool's about this deep, and you could see down and saw two little hands reach out, and it was an amazing experience reaching down and picking up this wee, wee guy. Two little arms reached out, and it was if, as if he was uh, totally dependent on someone to get him out of there, someone to look after him. Um, immediately they had to take him away and pump a bit of air into him a little bit, so he was totally dependent and reliant on others. Like a true father, our Heavenly Father offers us spiritual protection, nourishment, spiritual guidance, love and discipline, and life everlasting when we have submitted our lives to him through Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross. The devil, on the other hand, offers the complete opposite. No protection, no spiritual nourishment, no growth, no love, no discipline, and only a life that can ever lead to turmoil, only ever lead to turmoil and separation from God in hell. So where does our allegiance lie tonight? And how can we be sure? We might say, well, well I've been to church all my life. I've, I go to prayer meeting on Wednesdays and I pray. Um, I give tithes, I give money to the church. And I'm not too bad, but there's more evidence required in order to be a child of God, as we'll read tonight. God's word is clear. You, can't be you, you can only be found in one camp. It's impossible to serve two masters. Why do we need to be a child of God tonight? A fair question for those in the world. What does he offer us? His word is clear to all. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came th by Christ Jesus. And we read further in Romans, for the wages of sin is death. So that's the penalty. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's why we need Jesus as simple as it gets and as clear as it gets for everyone to see. Becoming a child of God. The Bible puts it very plainly that we were dead in our transgressions. And we heard this morning when Alan was talking about being stones. Stones are dead on their own, but we're made alive to be living stones through God's Spirit working in us and moving in us. We're in a state totally impossible to do anything by ourselves. We were helpless, totally dependent, like Josh was when he pulled him out for someone to help him. We needed God to intervene. Ephesians 2 verse 5 reminds us, But God, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even while we were dead in our transgressions, we had no ability to make ourselves alive. It just doesn't happen. But by God's grace. It is by God's grace you have been saved. You and I have no good in us that would ever chase God from the outset. We rely on Him to intervene first and by His Spirit move in us. This brings to light the amazing work God does in our lives, adopting us, as we read before, and making us His own child. You see, ad adoption is the act of the parents. They choose and desire to have that child in their, in their life, in their family, and to become theirs. Not because they're being told to, or because they have to, 
but because they desire that child to be in their family. In the work of adoption, at no point do we see the child initiating the process, getting all the papers together and organising the lawyers. The child is totally helpless to do anything to be accepted into the new caring family. They are totally reliant on the new prospective parents. It's a great reminder to us that the exact same situation is for all humans. Remember, we were dead. Our foot was most definitely in the wrong camp. It wasn't in God's camp, so what camp was it? It was in the devil's camp before he made us alive in him with Christ. In his great mercy, he moves in our hearts. He moves in the hearts of the spiritually dead and opens our eyes to start seeing sin for what it is and also see the glory of Christ and his sacrifice for his children. How great is the love of the Father that has lavished on us that we should be called sons of God, we read before. So a reminder, adoption is totally undeserved. It's initiated by the Father, which causes, causes us to praise him and be in awe of his goodness. However, once a person is in his family, there are certain responsibilities that we must uphold and certain evidences that we will see in children of God. And this one we're focusing on tonight that we find in Romans is dealing with sin. Am I a child of God? One verse that may have weighed heavily on your mind in the past, if you've heard it before, when doubts around your salvation arise, is found in Matthew 7, verse 21. It'll be familiar to some of you. Not everyone who says to me, this is Jesus speaking, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons, and in your name prophesy and do many miracles. Then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. When I was a wee guy, about 10 years old, probably, I had the same issue. Um, we were blessed to, to be in a home where mum and dad taught us about Christ and the need for Christ for our salvation. And I remember praying uh, like the sinner's prayer, you know, seeking forgiveness for the things maybe I'd done. And, and I remember reciting that. And I remember countless times wondering, did I actually mean it that time when I said it last night? And it, and it really, yeah, made me sort of, uh, yeah, I was, I was really concerned about it. And I was all torn up inside and I wondered, had I actually done it? Did I actually mean it last night? Am I a Christian? The truth is, like myself, there may be countless many people, even here tonight, that have probably recited that prayer and said the words but not actually surrendered their heart to Christ. In the passages we're focusing on tonight, it's showing us that assurance of our salvation is never based on us doing things or saying things. Even amazing spiritual events like prophecy and miracles, like we read in that verse there, these people obviously did them and they're saying, hey, look, I, we cast out demons, but... It obviously wasn't. They didn't have a relationship with God. Um, these things are actually no guarantee of the Spirit of God evident in us. We must remember that the devil himself is very tricky and powerful also. In the Romans reading, it's very clear to us that if you are led by the Spirit, you are a son of God. Is this you tonight? Is this me tonight? And what can we learn from this verse that proves that the Spirit is actually in us? and we are indeed his children. This verse is crucial in terms of teaching us what is expected to happen if you are his child and walking with God. Romans 8 verse 13 says, For if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Christian, is there evidence in your life and in my life of being prompted and made aware of sin? More importantly, is the Spirit leading you in battle to make war against those sins and putting them to death? As God sanctifies and changes you, as he refines you, is there an increasing hatred of the sins that crucified our Lord? Or do we suppress the conscience when we are convicted of these things, leaving sins to flourish and take hold simply because we enjoy them too much and they become much more important to us than knowing the joy that comes from the Lord? You see, if Christ is our saviour, we're a child of God. And if we're a child of God, as the word says, the Spirit is within us. And the Spirit being perfect 
can't coexist with sin. The Spirit will be at war constantly with the things that don't line up with His perfection. The two can't coexist, as I said. What I'm saying here is that if you are a child of God, you will without doubt be led by the Spirit to battle and make war on sin in your life. Your hatred and understanding of the seriousness of sin will grow. You may be listening tonight and be convicted of uh, sins in your life and that is a blessing that it would be pointed out and we'd feel that um, need to well, clean something up in our life. But that's not where it stops. That's where it needs to start. The change needs to start. There's many people that would be convicted of wrongdoings in their life and think, well, that's not too good, but then carry on doing it for their whole life. Many unbelievers, oh sorry, um, that thing you've been c convicted on, it demands action straight away. It needs to be wiped out of your life because remember the sin won't be happy, uh, the spirit won't be happy living with that sin. If a child of God, you'll eventually be led to put that sin to death, being led by the spirit, as the verses said earlier. There is no in between or no other option reading these verses. This idea is further backed up in 1 John 3, 6 and 7. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. My workmate um, back at uni <coughs> used to turn up in the morning to take over my shift and he was transfixed on my ability or inability to be able to speak in tongues because he thought well, if you can speak in tongues, you've got the Spirit. But if you can't speak in tongues, you haven't got the Spirit, is what he told me. And, uh, you know, I was pretty wound up by that. It's not the only um, doctrine that he had uh, wrong, I believe. The, the next one was, I was taken aback by, was the fact that he believed since he's a Christian now, he didn't sin. And I took uh, exception to it, because I knew I was Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ and I have the Spirit in me but I still continue to sin so I said to him are you telling me that since becoming a Christian you've not even put you know had one bad thought or actioned one bad thought in your mind and he said no so I don't know where he was going with that but um, I just said well you've just lied to me there so you can chalk that up against <laughs> it I said it smugly and probably quite smartly and it probably wasn't in love but it's clear for all of us here, Christians and non-Christians alike, that we will continue to sin as long as we're on this earth because it's a battle that will continue, uh, that we will have to make war on. So Romans 8.13 proves this to us. It says, for if, oh sorry, I've, uh, I've lost it there. Um... Here we go. Sorry about that. For if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We say we, if we say we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar. So there it is in John 1, um, verse 8. So we can confidently say that God's children do sin. You and I will sin in this life, but we will be led to fight that sin by the Spirit. Are you his child tonight? Are you being led by the Spirit to make war on sin in your life? Praise him if you know this to be true. Through these f th few verses then, we're starting to see a clear picture of what the evidence of the Spirit in our life looks like. We haven't yet begun to look at the fruits of the Spirit, things like faith, hope, love, peace, joy, kindness, which would be a sermon on its own, but if we're a child of God, those things will certainly be evident in our life also. What these verses are pointing out to us tonight is the severity and the seriousness of, of our sin and how it is impossible to be a child of God without the evidence of the Spirit leading you in battle to conquer the sin. It's not enough, as stated before, just to be convicted about it. The Spirit demands action against it. Maybe it's your love of things and hobbies that gets in the way of God being number one in your life. <coughs> If I was to produce a bar graph of my life over the week with the time allocated to certain things and my energy allocated to certain things, what would it look like? Would there be a massive bar 
with time talking to God and, and reading his word and serving him? Or would that only just show itself on a Sunday? Would it only register on a Sunday when I turn up here? If these things have taken over your love of God, being a child of God, you'll feel the Spirit convict you of these things and put them in their rightful place. A few steps down the ladder. He will make it possible and he'll give you the desire to have him as Lord. Maybe your thought life and lust has caused you to wander from a closer walk with God. Once again, once again, being his child, he loves and disciplines us. For what father that loves his son does not discipline him? An earthly father may see his child in error and think, well, they'll be okay, they'll sort it out. Or they'll come, come right on their own eventually. Well, it's not so with the spirit. He will be poking and prodding your heart, generating a desire to want to do battle with that sin. He's given us tools to do battle with these very, very things. Things like getting alongside someone you trust, an accountability partner, or if you're a bit more techy, downloading an accountability app or similar, which just sends your internet and your phone history straight to your friends straight away and keeps you honest that way. Well, let's use things like that that God has put in our lives at our disposal to use so that we can battle these, these sins. Maybe it's a relational issue with people in the community or even uh, family or even church family. It might be you tonight convicted of times we have wronged others or they have wronged us with no love in our hearts for even our brother in Christ the Bible reminds us that anyone who does not love their brother is not a child of God 1 John 3.10 and this is a really serious matter friends if we hold grudges against people and fail to love them sincerely it's a sin the spirit will definitely lead your heart to put to death you must deal with it, humble yourself, and forgive as Christ has forgiven you. If we claim to be a child of God, then we are claiming that we are subject to him, and that we have submitted to his kingship, and that we are totally reliant on his mercies and grace. This, of course, is not to say that we take a back seat and become lazy and expect everything to be done for us. You need to aid your spiritual growth as well by reading the word, praying, coming to prayer group on Wednesday, coming to church when the word is given for us. Just as children are expected to grow, we are to grow in maturity. As we are changed to be more like our saviour as he sanctifies us and refines us. However, unlike the child growing up in our home, our earthly home, we expect them and hope for them to grow up and mature and then leave home. Um, however, unlike the child growing up in our household, we hope we'll be will be more dependent and reliant on our Heavenly Father as his child. If you're a Christian, through these few verses, we can be assured of the work of Christ in our life, that his Spirit is in us. The leading of the Spirit in making war and growing in hatred against sin testifies to the fact that you are indeed a child of God if you've submitted your life to Jesus. For why would the devil grow hatred for sin in your heart? He wants you to sin. He wants you to love the sin. Do you see this more and more evident in your life as he sanctifies you, as he changes you? Pray that he will do it all the more. Be encouraged and praise him when he does convict you. What a gift that he would convict us and give us a chance to think about the things we're about to do. But don't let it stop there. Allow yourself to listen. Be led by the Spirit in the fight against that sin. Put measures in place to put death to death those things which so easily trip us up. Beating sin requires... Holy Spirit help and also action which is enabled by the Spirit leading us maybe you've listened to these verses tonight from God's word and you've honestly realised that you don't know this God who gave his son that you might live the fact is that yes you have been at war with God just as any Christian has been in the past before they knew God and we're at war with him, we're at enmity with him doing things that do not line up with his demand of perfection. Carrying on a disobedience like this with no regard for the Saviour, as we read earlier, can only lead you to hell. But there's great news for you tonight. If you would surrender to him, believe in Jesus Christ, that perfect Saviour, sacrificial lamb that gave himself for you, that so you might not have to experience eternal death and punishment. Be forgiven of your sins. 
and believe that he rose victorious over death for you. Seek forgiveness for those sins, but actually do something about them too. Because if you're led by the Spirit, you will fight against those things. It is then you're adopted into his family, a child of God, like we read before. Never to be cast out of that family ever. Let's praise him.